this is a photon, or at least a visual representation of a photon. And this is a slit in a piece of paper. Two of them, actually. And this is the famous double slit experiment. I'm sure most of you know what happens next. If nobody's looking, the photons will arrange themselves in the back wall in a waveform pattern, indicating that they traveled through the slits in a superposition of states. And if you add a sensor to one of those slits to try to determine which slit it goes through, the pattern on the back wall becomes two groupings, indicating that the photons travel through the slit as a particle. If you're somehow not familiar with the double slit experiment, I've got a video on it, you can go check it out for context, but long story short, when the particle is observed, its superposition collapses down to a particle state. It's one of the weirdest things in quantum mechanics. And often when scientists or science communicators describe what happens here, they say things like, it chooses which slit to go through, or it reacts to an observation. Uh, this is a massive oversimplification of what happens, but it gets the idea across. It's kind of like when people say that evolution chose to change an animal or a species in some way to adapt to their environment. Obviously, there's no being called evolution making a choice here. You know, it's just a manner of speech. But some scientists and philosophers are starting to consider, what if that's exactly what's happening? What if that photon or particle is making an actual conscious choice? Because everything is conscious. The double slit experiment is a good example of matter acting weird at the tiniest scales, but there are weird things happening at the biggest scales too. Take dark matter and dark energy. This is Pandora's cluster. The lights you see are stars and galaxies from at least four different galaxy clusters. The whole mess collided sometime in the distant past. And here's a composite shot, including x-ray information in red and the total mass concentration in blue. Notice all the blue mass is where there's no optical light? That's dark matter. In fact, 75% of the mass in Pandora's cluster is dark matter. It's thought that dark matter makes up 27% of all the mass in the universe. And most of the rest of the universe is dark energy. And nobody really knows what dark matter is. Same goes for dark energy. So in a real sense, 95% of what should appear in our telescopes is a mystery. So there are huge mysteries at the smallest end and the largest end of the scale. It'd be nice if all of these mysteries had something in common, like if there was some one effect that could explain everything, but we can't seem to find it. I mean, if the universe was a person, I think it was just messing with us. Maybe it is. One theory that attempts to explain the unexplainable in science is panpsychism. The basic idea is as simple as it is controversial. Everything is conscious. Like, everything. Galaxy clusters, conscious. Fundamental particles, conscious. A guy in a coma, it's complicated, but all the cells in his body and all the molecules in those cells are, in some way, conscious. The appeal of panpsychism is its ability to explain mysteries as a choice. You know, maybe dark matter and dark energy don't exist, and we only think that they do because the stars and the galaxies choose to act a certain way. Same for fundamental particles. Maybe quarks and electrons and photons, maybe they aren't that mysterious at all because they're making actual choices. Yeah, I know, just hang with me for a second. I've touched on panpsychism before in my video on the general resonance theory of consciousness. Tam Hunt, the co-author of GRT, offered a definition of consciousness in a recent paper that helps to kind of demystify panpsychism a little bit. According to Tam, consciousness refers to, quote, the capacity for phenomenal or subjective experience. In this context, phenomenal means something that is sensed, and subjective implies a point of view. So we say a thing is conscious if it can perceive from its point of view. Like, I can perceive lots of things. Sights, sounds, smells. Which, I swear one of the dogs keeps peeing in here. See, the dog is conscious. It made a choice to pee in here. Now, obviously, fundamental particles don't perceive the way I do. But they do have properties, like electric charge, that are acted on by their environment. Electrons are attracted to positively charged particles and repelled by particles of negative charge. That attraction and repulsion that electrons do, that could be seen as perception. And the fact that that attraction varies with distance suggests that electrons have a point of view. So you could say that about pretty much any object that has properties and interacts with things. This even applies to theoretical objects like magnetic monopoles and the strings of string theory. But how do we go from perception and POV to, you know, the consciousness that you and I have? Um, there are different theories that have different ideas. I've already mentioned my video on resonance, but let's just do a quick review. In the general resonance theory of consciousness, objects that vibrate in synchronized ways help develop a shared resonance, and this allows them to combine their consciousness perception. And then more complex consciousness, like our own, that results from all that smaller, simpler consciousness resonating together, sort of, a, sort of an emergence theory. A somewhat similar theory is called IIT, the Integrated Information Theory. This was developed by Giulio Tononi. 
Now this theory doesn't go all the way down to fundamental particles like general resonance theory does, but it does kind of speak to, you know, how a system communicates to create consciousness. It also proposes a measurement of consciousness. They call it phi. Um, and actually what phi measures is the integrated information of the theory's name. So what I mean by integrated information, so like color and shape, that's one example of integrated information. So like our eyes don't see red or round. They see red wavelengths of light and then depth cues tell us that the red thing curves away from us and therefore is round. Redness and roundness are just concepts that our brain has to combine or integrate to show us a red balloon. So in IIT, integration is physical. It's a, it's a physical thing that happens in our brains and our neurons do it by exchanging neurotransmitters. Now, in theory, an artificial intelligence could do the same thing by passing electrical signals through its circuits instead of neurotransmitters through neurons. But most computers are built in a way that prevents them from reaching higher states of consciousness. And that's because the human brain is structured to do a lot of uh, parallel processing. Our perception of a red balloon, for example, it's processed in various parts of the brain simultaneously with all those parts communicating with each other. Most computers can't do this because of the structure or the processing units, but what that implies is that as smart as these AIs are getting, they can never quite achieve human-like consciousness. That is, if they're running on normal computers, but neuromorphic computers, computers that are designed to be more like a human brain, can. Maybe. There have been some recent attempts to create neuromorphic computers. Uh, DARPA funded a project called Synapse about 10 years back, and IBM uses neuromorphic chips in its Summit supercomputer. By the way, Summit's being used to um, help crack nuclear fusion, so, uh, who knows, maybe we'll get artificial consciousness and fusion energy at the same time. That'll be a fun news cycle. Seriously, neuromorphic computers are way too deep of a topic to get in here, but uh, what it basically means is that they have a better chance of developing a consciousness like ours than your typical, you know, scaled up Dell computer. Anyway, GRT and IIT, those are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to panpsychism. There are theories out there about the role of vacuum energy, uh, quantum fluctuations and what that plays in consciousness. Roger Penrose was all about that last one. Yeah, Penrose's theories were all about microtubules. So like biological cells, they're partly held together by these tiny flexible cylinders that are called microtubules. And he speculated that in those microtubules, certain components could exist in a state of quantum superposition. And if that's the case, then they could also be entangled. And those entangled particles could allow for some emergent effects, according to Roger Penrose. Now there's some debate as to whether or not Penrose believed that consciousness could exist outside of, you know, biological organisms with the microtubules and whatnot, uh, you know, whether it's scaled across the universe, that kind of thing. The most confident statement we can make is that he didn't rule it out. So the universe may or may not be conscious, but you can be conscious about what you eat with today's sponsor, HelloFresh. See what I did there? If you're conscious of calories, there's the fresh and fit menu you can order off of. They're all under 500 calories, but don't skip on flavor. You know, since we're all trying to get into our summer shape, which it's August now, so should probably get on that. But even if you're not trimming down, HelloFresh uses the freshest ingredients brought direct from local farms and vendors, nothing processed, and hasn't been sitting in a shipping container for weeks by the time it gets to you. Aside from the fit and healthy menu, you can choose veggie options, protein plus, and pescatarian, over 40 different recipes to choose from every week for any size family. And the recipes are designed by professional chefs and the ingredients are pre-proportioned, so no measuring bunch of stuff, no excess food waste, it's all easy and it makes you feel like a hero in the kitchen. All this and it's 25% cheaper than eating at a restaurant. The food gets delivered right to your door, so no trips to the grocery store, so it saves you time as well. And if you go to HelloFresh.com and use the code 50 Scott at checkout, you'll get 50% off your first order plus free shipping. And by the way, I personally can get two meals out of each one of these meals, so they last a long time, um, they're really good, so it really does save you money. It is worth it. Give it a try. Once again, that's HelloFresh.com, order code 50 Scott for half off and free shipping. But back to the question of whether everything in the universe is conscious, uh, including the food you eat. Let's not think about that too much. Now, it does need to be said that most panpsychists are philosophers, so... Now, to be fair, there are physicists, astronomers, and neurologists that work on this that all approach it from different angles. One of those physicist-astronomer types is a former NASA consultant named Gregory Matloff. Dr. Matloff came to panpsychism through the work of Olaf Stapledon. Olaf Stapledon is a fiction writer, and if you haven't heard of him, well, maybe you should. Freeman Dyson said the Dyson Sphere should be called the Stapleton Sphere because it was his book, Star Maker, that gave him the idea. That same book also describes a universal consciousness made up of linked minds. This sparked an idea in Dr. Matt Loss, so he looked for a way to test if astronomical objects would be conscious. In his 2016 essay, Can Panpsychism Become an Observational Science? He points to the observational data that, quote, 
Cool, less massive stars circle the galaxy's center a bit faster than hot, more massive stars. He suggests this could be happening in a couple of different ways. One is that they're flinging their energy in one direction more than the other, uh, basically directed radiation pressure. The other is what he calls unipolar stellar material jets. Um, so this is where material kind of spirals into a massive object like a black hole or a star, and it sort of fires it out at the poles. You've probably seen animations about this, but this usually goes in both directions, but if it went in just one, it could move the star slowly over time in the opposite direction. And last but not least, Matlock suggests that psychokinesis may be doing it. Like, you know, psychokinesis. He admits this is controversial, but if panpsychism is a thing, and psychokinesis is a thing, it's a couple of big ifs, but if it were, it wouldn't take much to change a star's velocity over the course of, say, a billion years. Like, he suggested it wouldn't require more consciousness than, say, a developing embryonic cell. Yeah, okay, it's time. All right, so look, are we doing science here or not? Because if we're doing science, we got to be able to test this. And there are people working on that. Uh, in a recent paper, the authors discussed ways that we could maybe measure consciousness, and they proposed MCCs, or Measurable Correlates of Consciousness. And there are several subcategories of MCCs, the main ones being BCCs, Behavioral Correlates of Consciousness, NCCs, or Neural Correlates of Consciousness, and CCC, Creative Correlates of Consciousness. And they argue that the existence of any or all of the above suggests that the subject is conscious. It's the neural correlates of consciousness that have gotten the most attention. In fact, uh, one of the early researchers of this back in the 90s was Francis Crick, the DNA guy. Crick worked with another well-known scientist, Christoph Koch. Um, he's a neurophysiologist who embraced IIT as the best current theory of consciousness. He's also embraced vegetarianism because, you know, the meat might mind. Yep, Crick and Koch. That's, that's not a comedy duo. Crick and Coke. That sounds like a, a Coca-Cola ad at a cricket match. But for example, they worked with the original IIT theorist Trononi to try to sort of calculate consciousness of a worm by considering all the different ways that information could flow through its neurons. This is hard enough. It would be next to impossible to do this for humans, but they're working on finding patterns in EEGs that could, you know, show that different parts of the brain are communicating. Then there's behavioral correlates of consciousness. Uh, this obviously has to do with the behavior of things in physical space. And this could be everything from a cat purring when you pet it to a mosquito being drawn to carbon dioxide in the air. Maybe even photons and double slit experiments. And a really interesting branch of this has been applied recently in terms of the behavior of AI with several programs passing the Turing test in the last decade. And the last one I'll talk about here is CCC, the creative correlates of consciousness. Does the subject in question have the capacity for creative expression? Like it makes me think of the movie uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams that kind of makes the argument that it was only when humans began painting on cave walls and, and recreating what they saw in the world that we truly became human, which is an interesting thought to me, you know, as a creative person. Of course, today, AI can recreate images too, so does that count? I think that's an interesting question. And there are more of these correlates out there, but we do have to be careful to be objective because we have a tendency as humans to anthropomorphize things. You know, we, we tend to project ourselves onto the world. So we need to make sure that something is actually looking back at us and that we're not just seeing our own reflection in things. So look, th this is definitely woo-woo alarm territory, um, especially when you get into the idea that stars are consciously moving themselves around, uh, which I think is part of the plot in The Fifth Element. Where are you? Far now. Yeah, on that level, panpsychism, it isn't so much a theory of everything as it is something that fills the gaps in our current knowledge. Uh, one of the many things we've come up with. And, you know, talking about consciousness emanating from vibrational subatomic stuff, that, 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 gets, that gets pretty yikesy. Um, but, you know, who knows? As we come to better understand consciousness and we come to better understand the fabric of space-time, we might find some connections there. And besides, if it did turn out we're all just part of a universal consciousness, it might help us feel more connected to each other. That's not a bad thing. All right, big thanks to the answer files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to keep things running around here, forming an awesome community. I cannot thank you guys enough. Got some new members need to shout out real quick. We got Cody Sinat, Anthony Price, Jennifer M. Iturtak, uh, Philip Krieger, Mingai, Joseph, Frapkin, Shrugs the Straight-Faced Clown, <laughs> uh, Matthew Landry Matt, uh, Daniel Sheed, Scott Holloway, and Charles Groden. Gordon. 
Not Charles Grodin. That's an actor. Anyway, Charles Gordon, thank you guys so much. And uh, if you would like to join them, get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and get a little thing button next to your name that makes you a little bit special in the comments, uh, just hit the little join button down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check this video out. I'll talk about AI on this one because maybe it is uh, pertinent. Uh, or take a look at any of the thumbnails that down below on the sidebar that have my face on them. Go check them out. If you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. That's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.